lucky enough to have a job, chances are you have some job stress. Maybe a little, maybe a lot. Now, if you're an American, there's a very good chance that you're overworked and your job stress is chronic. And if you have children or elderly parents to take care of, these competing demands on your time may be adding an extra layer, creating a tiramisu of stress. Some of you may secretly wonder, how long can I go at this pace? What happens if I reach my breaking point? I used to ask myself those questions a lot, and then five years ago, I did reach that breaking point. This is a photo of my family taken around that time. As you can see, it was all working on the surface. <laughs> I had this loving husband, I had these beautiful children, that's my stepdaughter on the left and our other two on the right, and I had a fabulous job as a creative director at one of the best web design firms in San Francisco. It was a lot to juggle, but I was so determined <laughs> to make it work. I just fo focused on being hyper-efficient. I found myself pumping breast milk in conference rooms while editing business proposals. I know some of you are scandalized right now, but the door was shut. I uh, ate my dinner standing up while washing the dishes. I was the poster child for leaning in. I learned to delegate, prioritize, negotiate, and when necessary, give up things like seeing friends, alone time with my husband, and hardest of all, sleep. There was just one problem. <laughs> After that cute little baby was born, our son, and I returned to work full time, all this stopped working. It just seemed like no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get everything done that needed to be done my stress started to get out of control. First, I started having um, uh, ins insomnia, and that turned into panic attacks, and eventually a kind of black depression I never knew was possible. Somehow, I kept showing up at work every day, doing my job, pretending everything was fine. This went on for months until one day, I simply stopped quietly, the way a watch stops when the battery dies. What happened is I went home sick from this fabulous job that I'd had for six years, and I just never went back, not even to clean off my desk. I had completely burned out. It was a year before I was ready to work again. During that year, in addition to crying and feeling like a failure and trying different forms of medication, meditation, therapy, anything I could think of, and basically running through all our savings while we tried to live on one income, I also did a lot of writing. Writing was a way for me to make sense of this wretched state I found myself in, and I really needed to make sense of it. I mean, how did it make any sense that I'd spent 37 years of my life being this capable person, and then suddenly I was a basket case. I mean, how were other women doing this? Eventually, I did what all internet professionals do in a time of crisis. I started a blog. <laughs> But I'm so glad I did, because pretty soon I was hearing from women all over the country. They worked in every industry you can imagine. There were teachers, attorneys, academics, parole officers, corporate executives, web designers, journalists, you name it. Many of them told me that they too suffered from anxiety and depression. Some of them had more exotic maladies, like heart palpitations, or hives, or mysterious coughs that wouldn't go away. The point was that, just like me, they were maxed out, just trying to work and take care of their families. And in many cases, it was making them sick. So a couple of these women <laughs> randomly confessed to me that they had what I now call hospital fantasies. Any guess on what that is? <laughs> A hospital fantasy is the desire to get into a minor accident so that you will be relieved for a few days from your to-do list. Now, I know, right? So I have to say, I thought this was really weird. <laughs> I mean, as bad as things got for me, I never had a hospital fantasy, and I actually hate being in hospitals. But I did wonder if other people shared the strange fantasy. So I had this blog, so I just put together a poll, and I stuck it up on the blog. Guess what? Turns out, 68% of the hundreds of people who took the poll said that they, too, had hospital fantasies. What does this mean? 
It's as if we can't imagine getting any real time off anymore, not even in our fantasy life, unless we're physically incapacitated. OK, I know. Some of you are thinking, maybe this sounds a little over the top, a little shocking, but you know what? It shouldn't. Because studies show that America may be the most hostile country in the developed world for working parents of all income levels. On one hand, low-income workers are dealing with things like um, a complete lack of affordable childcare, rigid schedules, and no paid time off. Meanwhile, professionals are expected to work grueling hours, travel for business, and never unplug. And so even though we're experiencing this problem in different ways, the result is the same. It's chronic stress. To be fair, <clears throat> this is not just a women's problem. In fact, studies are showing that men, now that men are taking on more responsibility at home, they may actually be experiencing more work-life conflict than women are. Um, so how is this playing out differently for us? Well, the short answer is that we're still stuck in traditional gender roles. And so even when both parents are working, mothers are still doing a lot more child uh, care and housework. We're also doing a lot more multitasking. We have less leisure time, and to add salt to the wound, we feel more guilt about it <laughs> and more exhaustion as well. So it shouldn't be a surprise, then, that women are more at risk for the health effects of this stress. We're 60% more likely to suffer an anxiety disorder. We're 70% more likely to suffer depression. And we're even more at risk for things like heart attacks and diabetes as a result of workplace stress. OK, so I kept talking to people. I kept hearing these stories and doing the research, and I kept writing. And eventually, <laughs> it just became so clear to me that what happened to me wasn't some random, isolated incident. It wasn't even uncommon. It was just a symptom of what I've come to think of as a public health crisis. Here's what's really going on. Back in the 50s and 60s, most women stopped working after they had kids, and most families could thrive on one income, for better or worse. Today, we all know that's simply no longer true. And so today, most mothers work to help support their families, and the workforce is now almost half women. And yet, society and the workplace have not in any way caught up to this reality of our lives. So we're all living in a half-change world. On one hand, we're supposed to do our jobs as if we don't have families, and then we're supposed to be raising our families as if we don't have jobs. Lean in. Anyone who has picked up a newspaper or a magazine in the last year knows that this whole conversation about women and work has been dominated by this phrase, lean in. So in case you missed picking up a newspaper or a magazine in the last year, I'll, I'll kind of explain. This is the phrase made famous by Facebook's COO, Sheryl Sandberg. Um, and to oversimplify just for a moment, essentially what, what she's telling us is that women, by leaning into their careers, they can achieve their work and life dreams by essentially summoning their internal resources and trying harder. OK, now, to be fair, this, uh, this message has been empowering to many women. And there's nothing inherently wrong with the idea of leaning in. But the question is, how are you supposed to lean in when you're already maxed out? As many of us have learned the hard way, sometimes you lean in and you fall right over. <laughs> this isn't working. If we're serious, about empowering women to be leaders, if we're serious about simply making it possible for women to be breadwinners, to support their families, then something has to give. What is it? It's time for society to lean in to parenting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Here's what I mean by that. Um, Let's start with policymakers. So, so much of this conversation is about our obsession with women. Here's what women should do, and here's how women can lean in. Let's open it up. Let's invite policymakers into this discussion for starters. Policymakers can lean in, for example, by providing things like paid parental leave and paid sick leave. Now, these two examples are things that every single country in the entire developed world offers its citizens, except the United States. We don't do it. 
Another thing they could do is support affordable quality childcare. This is really, really important because this would make it possible for more women to work. And when women are able to work, families get out of poverty and economies grow. So people will say, oh, it's too expensive. But you know what? Poverty is expensive. Not being able to afford to work is expensive. This is an investment in the economy. Dads. <laughs> That's my husband leaning into chocolate cake with our baby. Um, <laughs> to be fair, a lot of dads, there are so many fantastic dads leaning into family. But let's be honest, we still don't have a critical mass of dads really pulling their weight at home. And to make that possible, it means that uh, a lot of men probably need to work less. Which brings me to my next point. Employers. How can employers lean in? Employers can lean in by making it possible, by empowering their employees to tailor their jobs to be compatible with their lives. Now, I know that sounds like a fringe benefit, and we're here in California, and it's like the crazy kind of stuff we do, but here's the thing. <laughs> a lot of companies are experimenting with all kinds of uh, ways of doing this, things like telecommuting, better flexible options, um, all kinds of flexible scheduling, job shares, better part-time opportunities. Now, when, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but when these things are done right, they cost almost nothing to implement, they increase productivity, they decrease turnover, they increase morale, it is such a win-win. It's not just good for our health, it's actually good for business. I want to tell you a quick story about how powerful it is when dads and employers and, uh, who's the other one I said, and policymakers, I can't forget them, uh, lean into parenting. It's a story that takes place in Sweden. Now, believe it or not, Sweden used to have many of the same problems that we have here in the, U the U.S. in terms of gender equality. Uh, moms did most of the childcare and housework at the expense of their careers, and um, there was a big pay gap between men and women. Now, Sweden had very generous parental leave policies, but it was almost exclusively the, the moms who used it. Something like 6% of dads tried staying home with their kids, and when they did, they were made fun of for being unmanly. Anyone speak Swedish in the audience? They were called a, a word, velour papa. I'm probably saying it wrong. It means velvet dad. So they were, they were made fun of for being softies. So policymakers in Sweden said, this isn't right. We're going to do something different. We're going to try an experiment. We're going to set aside one month of parental leave just for dads. Now, they don't have to stay home with their baby, but if they don't take that one month, the family loses the subsidies. Now, suddenly, the people of Sweden had this dilemma because the men were like, well, who cares if they call me a velvet dad? I'm not giving up free money. No one wants to do that. So dads started staying home with their babies for the first time, and everything started to change. Because dads started bonding with their babies in a new way when they were in charge, when mom wasn't around. And even after they returned to work, they started taking on some of the responsibilities that were traditionally the mom jobs, like giving baths and clipping the fingernails and setting up dentist appointments. Meanwhile, moms started returning to work a little bit sooner. The pay gap between men and women, this thing that we're always talking about, it's stuck, we can't do anything about it, well, it started to close. Employers saw, and this is really important, employers saw that this whole work-life balance issue, it wasn't a women's issue, it was an everybody issue. And so the culture at work finally began to change, with things like flex time becoming more, more common. Even the divorce rate started to go down. I'm not making this up. It's amazing. So this one simple change had this profound effect on society. OK, I know you're probably thinking, how does this apply to the US? We don't even have parental leave for mothers. Um, it's, we don't have paid parental leave for mothers. But that's not the point. The point is that when policymakers and dads and employers all decided to do things a little bit differently when they decided to show that they actually value what it takes to care for a family. That's when things started to change. Okay, when I started this talk, I started by telling you about how I maxed out five years ago. Back then, what I wished for more than anything was to be able to hang on to my career and still be the kind of mom that I needed to be to my kids. Um, 
since I'm still here on stage, you probably guessed the story has a happy ending. About a year after I stopped working, I started working again for myself. Today, I do the same kind of work that I did five years ago, but now I'm in charge. I do most of it from home, and I'm thriving. Um, I mean, I, I will be honest. Self-employment is not perfect. It's not that I never get overworked, but I have the flexibility that I need now, and it's manageable. So this isn't a talk about why you should quit your job, <laughs> although it sounds like it is. Um, but I know it's not realistic for everyone to just start their own business. However, I think it's important to see that most jobs can be made compatible with our lives if we use some imagination. So here's my wish for you. When you leave here today, my hope is that you will open your mind and think creatively. Ask yourself, how can I make my workplace a healthier place for myself, for my coworkers, and for my employees? Because it is time to lean in, but not just to our jobs. It's time to lean into our lives. And when we figure out how to do that, it won't just benefit women. It will benefit everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.